so I left, I left Oklahoma in 81, <laughs> long before you guys were born, but uh, so I graduated from high school there. I, I, my, and my folks were actually from Utah, and so. Oh, um, so I graduated and came out here to school and have pretty much been here since, except I was in Iowa for uh, you know, four years during residency and, and some fellowship there and came back. My wife's from California, we met here. So oh. this is pretty much our home. Yeah. yeah. Pretty, uh, it is our home, yeah. We've raised all our kids here and stuff. So it's, yeah, it's been great, we've liked it here. And as soon as I, as soon as I left uh, Oklahoma, hey, good morning. Um, my parents transferred to Denver, oh. and then my my really some of my really good friends, most of them actually, many of whom are still my good friends, all moved to Texas. So <laughs> you know, they live in Dallas and Houston, and uh, so I I have been back, man, just a couple of times yeah. since then because kind of everybody left uh -huh. and I did. So, but yeah, nice, it was nice growing up there. Well, it's seven o'clock. We'll go ahead and get started. And thanks for for, for being here. So, um, oh, oh, sorry, I want to grab one thing here. Before we get started, at least I think I do. So, so today we're going to talk about. Um, you know, optic nerve, which is uh, in glaucoma, I mean, bread and butter, right? That's what we're, we're all about, is uh, protecting the optic nerve. And um, so hopefully we can just talk about some things that'll be interesting to you and helpful, especially as you go in the clinic. And um, so first off, there are just some kind of fun facts about optic nerve that you'll probably need to know at some point, like on OCAPs and, and things like that. And uh, so who's, any of you taken OCAPs yet? Yeah, you have, how many times you've taken it once? Yeah. Can you remember by chance any questions at all that might have been optic nerve related on no, maybe OCAPs? Like, maybe like th three days after the test, but yeah. uh, after that it just kind of goes away. Yeah, it's just kind of a, 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 it's hard. a fog <laughs> after that. Yeah, no, OCAPs are hard. It's a hard test the glaucoma time. section in OCAPs is kind of varies from what I can tell, but uh, it's usually reasonable, but always they find some difficult questions, you know, for all the subjects. But um, so when I did my um, board recertification, which I've done a couple of times, there are almost always a couple of little fun facts about uh, optic nerve. One of them, do any of you know, like if, if I were to say how many, you know, nerve fiber, how many nerve fibers are, you know, constitute the, the optic nerve? Do you have any idea what that number might be? Two to one. There you go. That, that's the number that's been thrown around for as long as I've been, you know, since I was a resident. 1.2 million axons, okay? And these axons are, um, see if I can get this to go forward. Uh, axons are, hmm, hang on a second. Oh, oh, there we go. Yeah, 1.2 million axons, and they are uh, kind of bundled into about 1,000 fascicles in the optic nerve. And so this is a picture that is kind of, uh, uh, you know, been tossed around for a long time. It's right out of the BCS series, but uh, 1.2 million axons, 1,000 fascicles kind of separated by connective tissue in the optic nerve. Another kind of little fun fact is how much, if, if you're looking at detecting on a visual field, what's the te kind of the traditional teaching about how many of these nerve fibers can be lost before it's detectable on a visual field? Any idea what that number is? Yeah. yeah, it's like 50%. So that's another number to remember. Now, that's like a, an extraordinary number. Now, it's probably overstated because the study that was done, the landmark study that was done, which was done by Harry Quigley, you know, the Wilmer guy, when he was a young, young uh, faculty member. And basically, he you know, counted uh, nerve fibers in cadaveric eyes, you know, kind of using a, a process that they, they did to try to estimate how many there were, and then, and then comparing those to the most, the, or the last visual field that that patient had. And of course, it was just on a few patients, you could imagine, it's like four or five patients. And the perimetry was actually Goldman perimetry, which is not as sensitive as 
Humphrey and, and certainly not as sensitive as some of the newer perimeters. So that's probably overstated, but the point is, is that you can lose a lot of these nerve fibers before you detect it on a visual field, okay? So that's where OCT and that kind of stuff comes in that, that hopefully is giving us a little earlier detection. What about the types of cells uh, in the, the retina? There's a clue right there. Any, what, how, what types of cells are there and kind of what do they do? We can look up there. M and P, does that sound familiar at all? M and P cells, and, and th that's relevant. Uh, it's clinically relevant because it's important to kind of know what we're testing when we do a visual field, okay? And a lot of the other perimeters that are out there are designed to try to specifically test one of these cell types, okay? So the P cells are by far the most numerous. They're the smaller diameter axons, and they also have a smaller receptive field, okay? So, you know, the, these axons, they, they all have what they call a receptive field, and in P cells, they're smaller. And these are the cells that are sensitive more to color and fine detail, okay? Macula has a lot of P cells, for example, all right? The M cells are fewer in number, and they have larger diameter, and they have a much larger um, field that they cover, okay, the receptive field. And there's a statement there, okay, so they may be more susceptible to glaucoma damage. Well, well, why is that? Well, the M cells tend to be congregated in the poles of the optic nerve, okay? And, you know, that's where we see cupping, right? We see oftentimes that, that vertical cupping of the optic nerve in glaucoma, and so there's some thought, well, maybe these M cells, since they populate that area, are the ones that are the more sensitive. And these particular uh, cells are more for like motion and spatial relationship rather than fine detail. The reality is probably though, that the reason they show damage first is that there's just fewer of them. So it's this idea of reduced redundancy. There are all these P cells and the P cells have these overlapping fields, okay? And um, there's so many of them that you can lose a lot of P cells before you can detect that uh, with any perimetry. Does that make sense? Whereas the larger M cells, they don't overlap nearly as much. So when one of them dies off, it kind of tends to make a, a blank area in the retina, right, that you can detect with a visual field. So, so it might be that there's just this reduced redundancy, and that's why they're, uh, they're more tested. Now, another set, so when you're looking at perimeters, you know, the Humphrey perimeter tests a lot of P cells, okay? Some of the other perimeters, like, like uh, frequency doubling technology, some of the motion detecting visual fields, those are designed specifically to try to test for M cells where, um, you know, by motion and whatnot, with the idea being that we might be able to detect damage in those first because there are fewer of them and they don't have this field redundancy. Now there's another set, which are these bistratified cells, the conial cellular, and they are color sensitive and they process blue yellow. And so you've heard of swap perimetry, right? Short wave automated, short wavelength automated perimetry, blue on yellow. Familiar with that? Does that ring a bell? Have any of you ever taken a swap visual field? It's torture, let me tell you. So just as a side note, all of you ought to take a visual field if you haven't yet, okay? Just, just take one and realize what you're asking your patient to do. It's like I say, we don't make any friends make, you know, having people do these visual fields, but it's still the gold standard of following glaucoma, okay? So the white on, you know, black on white, we call it, right? You've got a white background and you're usually seeing a, you know, a lighted dot. Um, those are the ones that um, are the standard Humphrey perimetry, and that's mostly testing P cells with some M cells, okay? The blue on yellow, so you got a yellow background, and that's what's so torturous about SWAP, is staring at that yellow background. And then the light that presents, the light stimulus is blue. That's specifically trying to test these coniocellular. And again, the idea of trying to test cells that will give us the earlier, earliest detection, because there are just fewer of those. Okay, does, does that make sense? So that's just kind of a, you know, that's how that becomes clinically relevant kind of memorize this picture. Uh, you might see it again, but this just basically, if you, if you can kind of have that picture in your mind, you can totally understand 
the visual fields that you see in the clinic, okay? Why do you see those arcuate changes like that, you know? Well, those fibers that are showing the damage first are those sweeping arcuate fibers in the optic nerve, right? And so you can just see those. The papulomacular bundle, the, the bundle running straight from the macula into the optic nerve, that's overwhelmingly most of the nerve fibers in the retina serve the macula. And that's why central vision tends to be well-preserved in glaucoma, even though it's very advanced, okay? And um, you know some of the newer ideas about testing macular thickness with the OCT as a, as a way of maybe detecting glaucoma earlier is based on that principle that you know there's so many there that you aren't picking them up on a visual field again because they're so redundant one over the other. But maybe if you actually measure the anatomy thinning, that will give us the earliest detection. But that kind of sweeping, uh, you know, the the peripheral. So you, you just think of that for example. Why do we see? Uh, you know, nasal steps, right? You know, everything about this is inversed and ups inverted and upside down, right? So that those nasal um, uh, defects that we see are representative of temporal retinal nerve fibers, right? And they're sweeping over the macula and there's fewer of them. And so we get those nasal steps to start with and that sweeping arcuate, you know, just that picture tells the story right there. So. I think that's just kind of a, a good picture to have just kind of imprinted on your mind when you're looking at visual fields and you'll understand the, and the anatomy explains what you're seeing on a visual field. Does that make sense? Any questions about that at all? We'll skip over this a little bit. The one other thing that I think is important, uh, again, for like, you know, OCAPI kind of things, you know, plus obviously in the clinic, is the blood supply of the optic nerve, okay? This is a picture that um, you know, when I was taking OCAPS boards and, and recertification, not every time, but I've certainly seen this picture just on an OCAP test or on a board test. And so just kind of knowing, it's just kind of these fun facts that you just kind of need to know, the blood supply of the optic nerve, just, and that, that is it, it right there. This, the very surface of the optic nerve is vascularized by the central retinal artery. Then you have these prelaminar and peripapillary choroid and the short posterior ciliary arteries that are getting that prelaminar area, especially those short posterior ciliary arteries, okay? In the laminar region, again, you've got the short PCAs and the retrolaminar, right? The retrolaminar, which has a, a, you know, a, a covering of the, like the peel sheath, is vascularized by peel vessels. So again, just something to know uh, so that you can reproduce it on a test. So the critical thing about the optic nerve, obviously it's, it's what glaucoma is all about, what we're trying to preserve, but, but really what's most uh, important day to day is how to examine the optic nerve and how to you know, kind of use that to detect glaucoma and then also try to denote its progression, right? So let's just talk for a minute. What are the best tools you think? What, what in your hands for examining the optic nerve? What you know, I'm talking about lenses, technique. What what works best for you in terms of examining the optic nerve? I use a ninety. Okay. Ninety works well for me. Ninety is the deal. Okay, so ninety is the lens of the glaucoma doctor. I mean, it's the lens of anybody, but especially the glaucoma doctor. A ninety diopter lens. You just you just got to have one. So the reason you got to have one is that you can get through an undilated pupil. And, you know, you just can't dilate your, dilate your patient every time. But you need to look at the optic nerve every time. I, I, my patients, I look at the optic nerve every time, all right? Even if they're coming back every week for post-ops, I look at the optic nerve every time. It's just, it just kind of ingrain it in your, your evaluation process. So the 90 adapter, it does provide, even though you can get through a small pupil, it does provide pretty good magnification and you need to be able to have magnification. I tried for, for a few years uh, the, uh, a Volk lens, it's called the super pupil, and it is amazing at the view you can get through an undilated pupil with that thing. But I, in the end, I decided there was not enough magnification. And so I, I felt like it wasn't, given me the examination that I needed. So when, you, when you're looking through a 90 adapter lens, are you getting more of a, of a monocular or binocular view? 
it's often, in fact, most often it's monocular if you're looking through an undyned. And you can test that out. You know, next time you focus on an optic nerve through the 90, just close one eye and then the other, and you'll realize you, you mostly just have one eye looking at it, okay? But it, so it doesn't give you super stereo, but it does give you a good view through a small pupil with appropriate magnification that you can rely on that pretty well. Now, if you wanna do something different, and I have one of these in all my sets, this is a lens that's great. This is, a, this is the, uh, the Volk Super 66, but like a Volk 78, uh, a Volk 60, I mean, 60 is like super stereo. Um, but the thing about these, they're great. Magnification is amazing, and stereo view is amazing. But you, can, you almost always have to dilate the pupil. That's the thing. So when you have a dilated pupil and you really want to get a great optic nerve view, if you have like a 78, this is a 66, um, it, it's, a, it's an amazing view. And, and it's always stereo because you're, you do it with a dilated pupil. So I think one of these is handy as well. All right. So a 90 and something like a 66 or a 78. So this is like my you know, glaucoma kit right here, you know, got those two lenses, have a gonio prism, right? And then, of course, if I actually can still use this, uh, <laughs> like a 20, to, to, you know, look at the peripheral retina. But th those are kind of the tools of the trade, I think. So with the, the, those lenses, and, uh, and let's, let's uh, kind of look at some optic nerves. So I think the key to examining an optic nerve is to have just a routine in your mind about how you do it, okay? So what are, what are the important things to look at in evaluating an optic nerve? What, what are the things that you're thinking of that, that you wanna kind of check off when you're looking at the optic nerve? Margins, the color, and then the cup. Okay, margins, excellent. What, what do you mean by margins? So like are they sharp, um, they're not elevated. So like the margins of the disc itself. Okay, okay, excellent. Margins, color, cup. Okay, what, what, do you th what do you mean by cup? So we, um, I was actually just talking to Austin about this um, on cornea last Wednesday. So he kind of described it as like where the vessels actually go in to like through the lamina cabrosa, it's kind of what you're looking at. And so make the cup inside the disc and that gives you your cup to disc ratio. Okay, yeah, I think that's good. You know, you, you can use the vessels as pretty good markers for for you know the extent and the outline of the cup. Now, so what would you call that cup? Anybody? What what would you call that? Okay. Anybody else? So here's the thing. You're gonna have your own scale, okay? And your scale, they, they've done studies on that where they've they've taken like people that have been glaucoma specialists for 25 years and had five of them look at the same nerve and they would all call it something slightly different, okay? So you're gonna have kind of your own scale about cup to disc ratio, and it's just gonna kind of be yours. Just, just know that it's not super comparable. And, and that's okay, right? That's okay. Um, that's why we look at things like, you know, documenting with a photo and an OCT as being very important. But all those things are true. So we're gonna look at margins, we're gonna look at uh, color, we're gonna look at cup. Anything else we're gonna look at in particular? This size, right, you, you need to know, is this just a big nerve, right? And so if you have a big nerve, a, a bigger cup is allowable, okay? I like to do horizontal and vertical CD ratio. Okay, that's, that, you know, again, those are good good things. There's one other thing I, I think is super important. The rim, that's right. You know, so I, I really think that when you're examining an optic nerve, you, those are the things you check off. And so you just kind of have a, uh, you know, a. a it comes, becomes kind of a gestalty thing, right? You're gonna look at that nerve and you're just gonna automatically, you know, just look at the disc, is it big or small? Are the, are the margins clear? And then you're gonna look at the cup. And then you're gonna look, I mean, for 360 degrees, you're gonna look at that rim. The rim is really what tells the story, okay? Uh, and we're gonna show some pictures of that, but in glaucoma, the rim tells the story, really, about whether or not it's glaucoma. Um, you know, sometimes, it, sometimes an optic nerve is just going to concentrically enlarge in glaucoma, but more often, at least in my experience, you're going to see focal thinning. When you're talking about real glaucoma, you're going to see focal thinning before you see kind of, excuse me, concentric enlargement. Does that make sense? And I'll show you some pictures 
So examining that rim for 360 degrees is really important. And so just kind of have that checklist in your mind. So normal optic nerve, great. You know, we'd love all, all the optic nerves to look just like this. What do you think of this one? What's that? 0. 0.5, okay. Any other comments? Um, the vessels are hugging the rim. Yeah, they are, right? Just a little bit, it's kind of a deep cup, isn't it? A little deep. Just, just uh, you know, from, from this view, normal or abnormal? What do you think of the rim? Maybe a bit. Overall, pretty healthy, you know, I think. I think this is a, so, so would you work this nerve up? When, and when I say, use the word work up, I mean, you know, get an OCT, get a visual field. What if, so here's, I don't know if any of you um, heard, heard my talk the other day here, but I, I talked about how that second study of the oats, which is a super important paper, like I say, it's a real slog to get through, tons of statistics. But uh, the second oat, OATS-2, it's called. You know what I mean by OATS, ocular hypertension treatment study. Kind of looked at this. And this is the one where if you, uh, talking about treating people, you know, this treat to, treat to cure, like, which is kind of a cancer vernacular, that in the low-risk category, you would have to treat 90 patients to keep one from getting to glaucoma. But if you put them in the high-risk category, it's seven to one. I mean, you know, what a difference that stratification is. What are the things that allow, what were the other factors? So, you know, this, this could be totally normal. You know, that nerve could be totally normal. It also could be early glaucoma, maybe. What would be the things that, the other things, what are the other parameters that might put this into the higher risk category? Thin corneas, and that is the the great one right there. If you look at the oats oat study, and and we you know we we think we are grateful to just a couple of people who, when the oat study was being done, and all the patients were already recruited, and the, these couple of people, one of them being Jamie Brandt out of uh, Davis, who said we have got to measure the corneal pachymetry on these people. So they went back and measured pachymetry on all the patients. And lo and behold, pachymetry turned out to be the number one predictor of whether or not they got glaucoma, more than pressure. So if this person right here with that optic nerve had, what are the other parameters? So cup to disc ratio is one. What are the, the pachymetry is another that goes into that risk calculator. What's another? Age. Race. Not exactly. I mean, good, good, good thought, but it's not in the actual numbers of the oats. What's that? Again, not, not exact, very important, but not exactly. So there's age, cup to disc ratio, pachymetry, and pressure, right, what their pressure is. And then the other added parameter is the initial mean deviation on a visual field once you get it. So if you see that optic nerve and thinking of those things, what might make you go ahead and get an OCT or a visual field on that patient? If they had what? High, if, they had high, if their pressure were 28, absolutely, you'd be working them up. If it were 19, maybe not. But the biggie is pachymetry, right? So that would be a, that's a patient right there that I would say, nerve looks like that, they ought to at least get pachymetry, okay? So they need their pressure measured, of course, and get a pachymetry. So if that patient right there had pachymetry of 500 and or a pressure of 26, I would study them. On the other hand, if that person had a pressure of 18 and a, a pachymetry of 600, I'd probably just follow them, you know, without working them up. So those are the kind of decisions that you can use. That oat study is so powerful in that regard of kind of stratifying risk when you've got one. So basically what you've got here is you've got one factor that might make you a little suspicious about glaucoma, and that is they've got a bigger cup to disc ratio than you might see on most patients. Does that make sense? But chances are that nerve's gonna be normal, I would say, okay? But if they had some of those other risk factors, I would get some baseline studies for sure. How about that optic nerve right there? Any thoughts? 
starting to get real suspicious. That, you know, the chance that that nerve is normal is not zero, but it's, it's getting pretty low. You know, you are, you are two standard deviations from the mean away from normal, for example. So what is it about that nerve that makes you think that doesn't look too normal to me? What do you, what do you see? Deep cup, large cup to disc, absolutely. What else do you? Superior rim. There's a very thin superior absolutely. rim. That, um, vessels are all absolutely. 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 And that, of, of everything that's been said, super important. As I'm examining that nerve, that one is the most important. That superior rim, that is definitely thin. So you're going to work that patient up? That's a patient you're going to work up, and by work up, I mean you get your glaucoma studies, regardless of what their pressure is, regardless of what their pachymetry might be. You know what I'm saying? That's a nerve that has to have some baseline studies done. And I think on that one, because of you know, that thinning of the rim, uh, I think there's a high probability that you would see a visual field defect in that patient. And I guarantee you that you're going to see an OCT abnormality. And that's, uh, you know, we could talk about, uh, you know, those things. I know you have, like, uh, visual field lectures. and Do you have an OCT lecture ever? Uh, I know I did the visual field for years, but I think so someone else is doing that now. But anyway, so, you know, OCT and visual fields. Um, visual field is still the gold standard. But th these, these, these kind of initial patients that come in, excuse me, come into your clinic, and you're kind of deciding on, is that, is that a normal nerve or not? That's when the OCT, in my opinion, has its most power, is in those early phases where you're really trying to say, is this nerve normal or not? The further you go, and, and any of you, you know, in, in my clinic, I have a ton of super advanced patients. The more advanced the patient gets, the less helpful OCT becomes, okay? But early on, something like this, that patient just walked into your clinic, you're gonna work that patient up. OCT is super helpful in those kind of initial, when you've still got some nerve to measure and you've got that focal thinning, uh, I bet that OCT would just pick that out like crazy, you know, with that real focal thinning superiorly. But that's enough that I think you'd see a visual field defect too. So big cup, deep, definite thinning, that, that's a nerve you gotta work up, okay? Very good, any questions about that? All right, let's look at some others. What do you think of that one? If you just look at that, what do you think that person's refractive area is? Yeah, that, that is the classic myopic nerve, okay? Tilted, it's got all that peripapillary atrophy. You can look at the fundus, you know, it's got that myopic fundus look. And I, I truly think that differentiating a myopic nerve from a glaucomatous nerve is one of the most difficult challenges that we have. Um, because they can look really, really similar. So what, what are some, what are the, again, you, you have this kind of checklist in your mind of what you're gonna go through. And so what, what about this optic nerve uh, stands out to you? The obvious one is all that peripapillary atrophy, right? So you've got all that PPA. What, what else do you see? What do you think of the nerve itself? Tilted, right? A little tilted. Actually, it's pretty healthy. Though. I think it looks very healthy, actually. You know, to me. Um, and the the point of this slide is just to say that sometimes you can see a really normal optic nerve surrounded by a bunch of stuff that doesn't look very normal. Okay, but so in this one, we, the idea is to not get distracted by all the myopic change and focus in on the nerve and kind of go through your same checklist of things on the nerve, right? It's got good margins. The rim looks pretty good to me. It's, it's you know, the cup is within reason. And again, it, this optic nerve, there, there'd have to be something else going on. They got a high pressure or something like that that would make me think, wow, I need to work that up. Yep. Yeah, I have two clarifying questions. One is, how are you estimating the depth when you're looking at these pictures of the cup? Yeah. Um, it's mostly by color. You know, obviously we don't have a stereo view here. So it's mostly by color and 
uh, whether or not you can see actually the lamina. You know, sometimes you can see in a really deep cup, you can actually see those connective tissue separators of the, uh, of the lamina cribrosa. Now that would be a really deep cup. But this one is just, we say deep, just based on kind of the color and you can kind of see, in that one you can just kind of see, just barely, a little bit of that kind of grayish lamina in the bottom of the cup. Can you see what I'm talking about? That's just kind of those gray little speckles. And that's kind of the top of the cup. I, you know, I, I, we could be hallucinating, but, yeah. <laughs> but it is sort of there. Yeah. I, I'm not sure I understand the difference. Yeah, and, and I, yeah, that's, they call it zone, you know, they have that zone one. And in my mind, the zone one is the, the zone right next to the optic nerve. That, that's my very simplistic way of thinking of peripapillary atrophy and this zone one. There's this uh, German fellow who is the one that's kind of championed that idea of this zone one peripapillary atrophy is being a marker for glaucoma. And so this, if I were to say, uh, I don't have a pointer, but if I were to say here on this one that zone one would be that darker rim of peripapillary atrophy that is right next to the optic nerve. And then the kind of lighter area that extends out beyond that, and you can kind of see that boundary there, that would be zone two. I will tell you honestly, that is not something that to me clinically, you know, like on patient 55 that day, that has really had a lot of clinical help for me, but it's certainly something well described, is that idea of zone one, zone two, and that's how I divide them up. Okay, very good. How about this optic nerve? Okay, just kind of, What's that, I'm sorry? So the superior center, I guess. Definitely does. D does to me too. Anything else about it? Very deep. deep. So once again, that thinning of the superior rim of this optic nerve to me is the most striking feature. That's the one that gets your attention in the clinic. You know, you look at that optic nerve and you're, you're doing your checklist, right? And one of the checklists, one of the most important is that for 360 degrees, you're looking around that optic nerve rim, okay? 360 degrees, and you come to that superior part and you go, whoa, that, that is, that's thin. That's almost like a focal notch, okay? Now, a focal notch is kind of the, in my mind, the pathognomonic optic nerve sign of glaucoma. There's just not really anything else that does that. In uh, studies that have been done that have looked at optic nerves, that some of which are, you know, you know, many, many optic nerves, some of them that went on to have other diagnoses, you know, like a, a optic nerve tumor or something like that, right, masquerading. The one thing that kind of came out, fell out as the most specific for glaucoma is that focal notch. Number two is probably disc hemorrhage, classic disc hemorrhage, okay? So when you're kind of looking at optic nerve and wondering, do I need to, is this like something else? Uh, that if you can see that focal notch, that you can pretty much hang your hat on that, that that is glaucoma, okay? And that's kind of getting to be a pretty focal notch right there, all right? And again, that's a patient you're gonna work up for sure, right? And almost, almost for sure, you're for sure you're going to see that on an OCT. And why do I say that? Well, because you've got all that measurable inferior rim that's going to get measured and then compared, right? So you're going to see on an OCT, you're going to see a focal defect there, right? And that's probably enough of a notch that I bet you're going to see that on a visual field as well. So I bet both come up positive uh, for findings in, in this optic nerve. All right, let's look at some others. How about that one? Big. I mean, it's a big disc. That's a really big cup. Anything else about it? All the rims are very similar. 
Yeah, so here, here's an example of just concentric, in, in, in my view, pretty concentric enlargement of the cup without um, much notching, okay? So what if that patient here, I mean, we're, we're probably gonna work that out, aren't we? That's a nerve that you're probably not, not gonna let walk out of your clinic without getting something done, okay? So we're at minimum gonna get an OCT in a visual field. And that's probably one that I would have a little suspicion of that. What if, the, what if that person right there, um, what if that person has a pressure of 15 and pretty you know, normal pachymetry? And you get their studies back and they're a little bit equivocal. You know, that doesn't, you know, that doesn't really look like a glaucoma field or kind of just diffuse loss on the OCT, for example. Yeah, that, that, that's, a, that's an oddish looking nerve. Uh, and I, um, yeah, I think if you were to, if that, if that patient came in with a pressure of 15 and normal pachymetry, not a family history, um, you know, that might be one to have a low threshold to think about working up that, with that kind of concentric enlargement like that. I and mean, we'll talk about that again here in a little bit. Let me make sure I'm not running over time. More of the same. Any thoughts on this one? What's that? Huge notch. Big notch. You see anything else? Can any of you see in that photo that kind of nerve fiber layer defect? I can see it better on my screen than you can up there. But there is that little, I'll, we'll show a better example in a minute. There's that little band of slightly darker retina extending from that notch in that arcuate fashion. I think you can use your mouse to point to Can I do that? Right here. There's the inferior border of it, and here's the superior border of it. Can you see that? No. Oh. Okay. Can I do it up here? Uh, I can't. But anyway, this, I'll show you another picture, but the inferior border is like right up there. If I were taller, I could show you. I'll show you a different picture. Looking at nerve fiber layer defects again is, I think, really hard to do in the clinic. But sometimes you catch it on a photo, and it's just another marker of a focal defect. Usually, though, the reason it's not as important in my mind is usually the nerve has already told the story. Okay? But you hear a lot about you know, taking red-free photographs and looking at nerve fiber layer defects. Again, usually the optic nerve has told the story. This is classic glaucoma, focal notch, big cup. All of your testing will be done. Now, here is some zone one peripapillary atrophy. See that right there? That would be more glaucomatous than myopic, in my opinion, right there. Okay. So that's when you, you know, that's when you look back and you go, wow, we are, we are really in trouble here. You know, you hate. I put this photo in because this is a patient that I'm looking at for the first time, you know, and we're making the diagnosis, and my gosh, their nerve looks like that. that that's really a, that's a sad day, you know, because you're so far down the line that you're just, you're just in the trying to hang on game from the first moment you meet them. So that's, that's a bad bad nerve right there. But sometimes that, that's just an example of end stage glaucoma. So how are you going to follow that nerve right there? Yeah, yeah. It just in general, your only way to follow them is a visual field. I mean, OCT would give you no information. And I would tell you that at that point, even clinical examination, you, you just can't differentiate change. And so visual field, 10-2, size 5 target, you know, whatever it takes. But honestly, in, in eyes like this, what the patient says is really important because you're just grabbing at things to try to monitor them with. And so if they come in and they say, I just really feel like my vision has worsened over the past you know, four months or whatever, you just, you just have to believe them in that case and, and just say, OK. You know, that's as, that becomes as good as a visual field in my mind when disease gets this advanced. All right. Now, there is a nerve fiber layer defect. Can you see that right there? 
that wedge coming down from that inferior notch. Okay, so again, that's great and that's really cool if you catch it on a photograph. Chances, your chance of seeing that in the clinic with a 90 diopter lens is, is low because you just can't get that big wide panoramic view. But again, the nerve has already told you the story. You know, you can see that notch right there. But that is a good example of a nerve fiber layer defect. And then I have one other high mag view. Again, you've got that notch inferiorly and then you've got that wedge of discoloration of the retina extending from that. Can you see that there, what I'm talking about? So just nerve fiber layer. But again, now see, now this is a nerve that is, that's just such a classic glaucoma nerve right there. Because you've got a lot of healthy rim, but then boom, you're looking at that inferior thing, see what I'm talking about? And then just, there's that notch right there. There's types of retina that makes things really hard to see. Like sometimes when I look at a tigroid fundus. Yeah, like you bet. I mean, a lot of it depends on background what their kind of background pigmentation is and things like that. Okay, now, the obvious thing. So it looks really obvious, right? There it is, boom. But in all of the studies, all of the big glaucoma studies that have been done where there have been reading centers, and that would be OATS, normal tension, glaucoma, AGIS, you know, all those major studies where the reading centers, the number one missed finding, disc hemorrhage the number one by far. And most of the people in the clinic looking at these nerves are, you know, glaucoma specialists, they've looked at thousands and thousands of optic nerves, but it's the number one missed finding, uh, is didn't, didn't put down, didn't detect a disc hemorrhage on that day. There's a classic disc hemorrhage. If by chance you see one, that is really, really specific for glaucoma, okay? Now the thing about it though, is that a disc hemorrhage can look you know, they're all, they can be very different. This, is, this one could not be more classic, right? It extends off the disc margin. It's that kind of flame-shaped hemorrhage. All, you know, all the descriptives that you hear about, you know, there it is. So that's a great example. But just to show a few others, spot the one here, right? Everybody see that? Everybody see the one I'm talking about? Down inferiorly there runs along a vessel. Those are the hardest ones to detect, the ones that run right along a vessel. And, they, and you, you kind of think that's just part of the vessel or maybe a vessel. But like this one, it runs right along the side. Now notice this one is in a already existing notch, right? That inferior rim is thinner than the superior, agree? And, and there's the disc hemorrhage. And that's common, that you're gonna see disc hemorrhages in previous areas of notch or you see a disc hemorrhage and then it, they come back three or four months later and there's a notch there. I've seen that many times before. What do we, yes? What causes a disc hemorrhage? Infarction, just ischemia. And it, and it, it just, you know, it just infarcts and it has, causes a little hemorrhage right there. Now, what causes the infarction? That is the million dollar question. Is it, is it barotrauma, you know, pressure damage or is it a, a vascular insufficiency? That, that's the million dollar question, but it's thought to be infarction. And I was just gonna ask, what, when we see a disc, disc hemorrhage, what, what do we interpret that as meaning? Yeah, the, the glaucoma is not under good enough control. So do we always treat a disc hemorrhage? Do, when we see a disc hemorrhage, do we always ramp up the treatment? Often, I mean, I, often we do. Now, if that next step is a trabeculectomy, you know, I might look for confirmation on a visual field. I guess what I'm saying is if nothing else had changed and I see a disc hemorrhage and I've already got them on three meds and they've had SLT and the next steps are trabeculectomy, I, I, I don't think I would do a trabeculectomy based on a disc hemorrhage, okay? Does that make sense? You know, in, when we're talking about ramping up treatment in glaucoma, so much of it is, well, what is the next step? Now, if that patient comes in with that disc hemorrhage and they're just on latanoprost once a day, and we haven't tried anything else, absolutely, we're gonna ramp that up, okay? We're gonna start them on a second drop, maybe talk to them about laser trabeculoplasty, you know, because our next step is pretty minimal risk, but again, it's always about what the next step is. But, but in general, in general, when we see a disc hemorrhage, we're probably gonna ramp the treatment up, okay? Just a couple other examples here. That's a disc hemorrhage. 
looks very different, doesn't it? But it is. We would interpret that as a disc hemorrhage. Everybody see what I'm talking about there? Just that blush of hemorrhage. It's actually down in the cup, down inferiorly there. Okay? You spot that one? Okay. So what if this patient had like a less suspicious nerve and they also had diabetes and they had dot blood hemorrhages everywhere else? I'd watch it. Okay. The classic disc hemorrhage will go away. Now I realize some diabetic hemorrhages can go away as well, but if this had an otherwise more normal nerve, normal pressure, diabetic with diabetic retinopathy, um, you know, yeah, I might, I might watch that. I might not just assume right off, oh, you, yeah, you also have glaucoma, if all the other parameters were pretty normal. But, but in this setting with that nerve, that's a disc hemorrhage. Getting a little harder. But there is one there. Everybody see that one? Down inferiorly there, just right off that vessel. <coughs> Just a small little disc hemorrhage right there. So they come in all safe and sizes, but if you see one, uh, it means different things. Certainly, you know, they are indeed more common in this thing we call normal pressure glaucoma, okay? So it's like one of those things. Normal pressure glaucoma, sometimes you're there in the clinic and you're wondering, gosh, is this something else? I mean, this pressure has never been above 15 and yet they're losing field and whatever. If you see a focal notch or if you see a disc hemorrhage, that is overwhelmingly likely to be glaucoma, okay, those two things. Okay, These, this is uh, same patient, two eyes. Left eye, right eye. What's that? It's a lot of asymmetry. That is a lot of asymmetry. So what starts running through your mind, you're just seeing that patient. Let's say that patient was referred in to you. Because this is a common thing, okay? Let's say that patient was referred into you. They're already on three drops, okay, or something. Maybe they've already had SLT. They seem to be getting worse, and their pressure is 15. What, what, what do you kind of need to do? Scan them. So... Exactly. So you're on that, that course. This is, that needs to be explained. That kind of asymmetry needs to be explained. So here's the first thing I do in this setting. Okay, they're already being treated, right? So the first thing I've got to do is I've got to go back through the notes, get old notes. And if I find that, because this is, you know, sometimes you don't get this information at first. But you have to go dig for it. You, you've got to, you've got to explain that. Now, the first thing I do is I get the old notes. Now, if this patient, and they're probably already pseudophagic, right? So if this patient eight years ago, 10 years ago, came into their referring ophthalmologist with a pressure of 42 and they had exfoliation disease, I'm done. Okay, I've explained it. Their pressure was 40 in the past or traumatic glaucoma or something like that. You know what I mean? Somewhere in the past, they had this documented major pressure episode. That would be an explanation. But if I go back through their record and their pressure has never been above 20 and they've just been treated because they came in and their optic nerve kind of looked like this, that's that I'm gonna scan that patient, right? So asymmetry like that, um, you, you just gotta explain that. And, and oftentimes it's just documenting a high pressure in the past, but you're obligated to document so that you can explain it. But that's a, if you can't find a high pressure episode in that patient, then definitely you'd scan that patient. A few more. I, I, I don't mean to play read my mind, but uh, th that's just a funky looking nerve, right? I mean, that's just an anomalous nerve. And, and I have that phrase, I just write it down. This is an anomalous nerve. And by that, I mean, you know, we're not gonna be able to tell much by looking at that optic nerve, right? And who knows what's going on there. So that's where we're gonna rely, again, heavily on visual field, right? Because that, that OCT is going to be funky as well. So that's just a nerve that, it's, it's, it's a congenital nerve, anomalous nerve, and uh, you're just going to have to follow visual field data and pressure data on that one. 
Does that make sense? This is? So drusen and high pressure is just a nightmare because you just never know what you're measuring, right? Because drusen can cause horrible looking visual fields in and of itself. So what are you gonna do? How are you gonna follow that nerve and that patient? And, and what are you gonna, what's your threshold for treatment, things like that? Any thoughts on that about drusen and Absolutely. Absolutely. Absolutely, it does. But I don't know how Drusen, like classically, the nerve would change the visual field, field compared to how glaucoma, glaucoma does with what we just talked about with the arcuates and the steps. It, they can look e extraordinarily similar. So, I mean, I, everything you're saying is very true. And so, basically, this is one situation where you oftentimes end up just treating the pressure. You know, I, I, you know if, that, if that patient walked into my clinic, me, and, and this is my, my opinion, and had a pressure of above 22, I'd treat him, you know, because it, you, you just don't know. So this is a, 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 a clinical situation where you oftentimes just end up treating a pressure, which we hate to do, right? We hate to say that, to just treat a pressure. But the reality is sometimes in glaucoma, you do, you know, like some of these horrible nerves that, have, that we've looked at today, you know, if those patients have a pressure of 20 or 22, you just go, you know, this is, this is a mismatch here. This is not gonna do well. And, and we look to bring their pressure down. And this is another example. It just, sometimes you just have to treat the pressure in these patients. I've trabbed patients with bad drusen and pressure and bad fields and pressure that I just couldn't get under control because I, I, I mean, I just don't know. Their field's getting worse. Is it drusen glaucoma? I, I don't know. So we just talk, have, you know, the patient and I have a long talk about our inability to really differentiate. And, you know, I've, I've gone to trabeculectomy in some of them. So it's, this is a hard situation, I Do think. Does it increase the risk of uh, damage or high pressure? Uh, uh, yeah, that is the thing. That's exactly the idea right there. And if you talk to our neuro ophthalmologist here, I think all of them are very much believers in that. This idea of the two hit uh, notion that if they have both Graves' disease and pressure, if they have both drusen and pressure, if they have both optic neuritis and pressure, that that kind of double hit is makes them really susceptible. For whatever reason, it's not just that they make it hard to follow the nerve, but maybe you should be treating uh, extra carefully. Yeah, that, that's that's exactly the the philosophy right there, and that's why I say often in them we just treat the pressure, even if we don't have evidence that it's the glaucoma that's doing it versus the drusen. We just treat the pressure to again, try to you know, eliminate one of the two hits. Can't do anything about the drusen, but we can lower the pressure. Okay, great, excellent. Um, let's go to that one. What do you see there? Common optic nerve finding. Well, not common, but certainly not rare. What's that? It is a pit, that's a pit. Pit can be congenital can be acquired. I mean, you can get a pit from glaucoma, and I've got lots of patients over the years that have, have an acquired pit that um, you can see develop. So that's just another, that can be a, a sign for sure of pretty advanced glaucoma is the development of a pit. But they can also just be, uh, you know, congenital. So I, I, again, it's just another thing that makes it a little difficult to follow when they have a pit, unless you have documented in your own kind of record the, uh, the, that they acquired that pit over the advancement of their glaucoma. But a congenital pit's kind of hard to interpret. Again, this is just kind of a few pictures that make things difficult. And then here's a, a nerve, and I know you can't see it in stereo, but um, this is when you talked about margins. So this is one where the, you know, the margins are a little blurred there, right? And you got that peripapillary atrophy, and that's kind of a junky nerve to try to follow as well. And you know, are they are they enough to are those nerves blurred enough that you'd scan that patient? Well, you know, maybe. Um, I, I would try to get an OCT on that patient. I'd try to get a field on them, just see what it showed. Um, but that's a, that's a nerve that's going to be a little bit hard to follow. And just another example of optic nerves that, that you look at, and you sometimes are put in a position to try to follow them. So. Um, 
just in summary, I think you know you got to have the right tools to look at the optic nerve. That's what it's all about. You have to have a a method in your mind that when you examine an optic nerve in the clinic, you're just going to checklist off certain things. But it has to include everything you've said, which is margin, color, cup, rim is super important, focal notching or thinning, disc hemorrhages. You know, all of those things just need to be a part of your routine for looking at an optic nerve. And, and you know, you just, you have to be able to get that view. And I have some patients that I just have to dilate every time I see them. Their pupils are so small or they have some opacity, you know, a little cataract or something in just the wrong place or something that I just have to dilate them every time. And, I, you know, that's just, that's just the way it is and they know that. Um, but you have to be able to evaluate the nerve. Taking a photograph with the, of the optic nerve at, at some point early on is indispensable. And I should take more pictures. Uh, there's a couple of things that there's a logistical thing in that you can't, just saying, you can't bill for a photo and an OCT on the same day. So you have to split those up. But to have a baseline photo, I don't take, I don't much take photos every year. Some people do. But I mostly just get a baseline one and then use that as, you know, to follow. But to have a photograph is just really an important thing to do early on, okay? OCT, great, especially early. It gets less helpful late. And the longitudinal use of OCT, it, you know, we wish it were better. That's been studied for several years now, and there's, you know, there's gazillion dollar grant out there to study longitudinal OCT, and so far it's kind of come up with not much. So I think, again, to, in that early detection is where OCT has the most power, and the more advanced the disease gets, the less helpful it becomes. I still get a lot of OCTs, even serial OCTs. I don't make tons of treatment decisions on an OCT change. And if I don't see an OCT change of at least 10 microns, I think that's the same. That's kind of my, my scale, is about 10 microns. That's more just global, yeah, looking at that global thickness. But the same looking for focal changes, you know. It, it, but it's got to be a, like a three micron, five micron change on OCT. Yeah, that's just, that's just uh, noise, you know, to, to me. Also, just one last thing on an OCT, that when you're looking at using it for optic nerves, anything that takes that OCT to zero is almost always an artifact. So, you know, when you're looking at an OCT and you see it dipping down to zero in one or more places, sometimes it's just the whole thing is dipping down to zero, you know what I mean? It's just you got to throw that out. That is inadequate. And uh, you know, don't even use that to interpret. Okay, and there's some eyes you just can't get an OCT, and I've, I've, I, I write up in that little specialty comments box, no more OCTs because it just doesn't work in that patient. Visual field is still the gold standard. I know patients hate it, and it's fraught with, you know, issues. I, I totally get that, but it's especially for advanced patients, it is still the gold standard. So optic nerve, it's just learn to examine the optic nerve, look at it every time know what other parameters make a, an optic nerve at higher risk. We've talked about those, pachymetry, pressure, age, and then also that initial mean deviation value on a visual field. Those are the ones that go in that risk stratifier. Great, we're almost out of time. Any, we are out of time. Any questions or anything? Yes? Uh, und undetermined. I mean, it's, it's, it's real and there are studies out uh, on it, um, but I think it's you know, it's, it's, it's one of those things that it, it, it's not 100% defined. Um, I, don't ha I don't have a machine up here. I'm not clamoring to get one. Um, pachymetry, indispensable. Indispensable. Hysteresis, kind of an emerging, you know, technology that we'll see how it goes. Certainly, like anything, it has its, you know, evangelicals about its importance, but it has, it certainly doesn't match up to pachymetry because it just doesn't have the data to, to back it up. Speaking of other technologies, do you ever get VEDs and does that have any role in determining the etiology or? You say VEPs? VEPs, yeah. I don't, but again, you know, focal ERG people, VEP, they're, they're uh, well, I, I guess I shouldn't say never. I mean, I, I do in certain circumstances. 
like I do in uh, patients I can't communicate with, like we get a lot of them in kids, get a lot of them in uh, you know, nonverbal patients for whatever reason, absolutely in that setting. But it's just far as like the, you know, the bread and butter following a communicative patient in the clinic, VEPs, for me, very few. Same with focal ERGs. But again, you can absolutely find the advocates out there for those things. Um, I, you know, I think this kind of macular thinness is probably, of all the things that we've mentioned here, that's probably the one that is emerging the most as far as being a, that's probably going to be a pretty helpful tool, um, is those macular thickness maps as a, as a sign and detector of glaucoma. And again, the idea being there's so many of those macular fibers that you can detect thinning of that anatomically before you can measure it with any kind of functional test, because there's just so many of them. Okay.